Hey everybody, welcome to Texas e Chat. I'm Serge. I'm Rob. I'm Gen Z. I'm Gen X. And today we're doing a reaction to Sabaton History. So um, we just did, the other day, we just did a reaction to their song Night Witches, um, which the wheel landed on. And now we're going to do a reaction to the history behind the song. So um, as always, we're very curious to see what um, Indy Nightdale has to say with about the, basically the history behind the conflict. Um, and basically this one's about the, the female bombers who are part of the Night Witches unit. Um, which was for the Soviet for, Union. For the Soviet yep. Union, yep. Um, during World War II, which was one of three regiments, and it was apparently the least experienced regiment of the three. Um, and it sounded like, as a result, they got some outdated equipment. So I'm curious to learn some more about it. Um, we, of course, did a little bit of reading on Sabaton's website in the last video, as you can see at the very end. And we're curious to see what else there is. So let's check it out. Let's check it Cindy out. Cindy is very interesting here. It looks like they have the lead singer. Okay, here we go. When you think of the soldiers fighting the Second World War, you probably think of men with machine guns. However, in our song Night Witches, we're singing about badass women in bomber planes. Yeah. <laughs> mm, there goes that song in the background. Yeah. Pretty cool. So we get some footage an actual biplane as well. The large-scale industrialization of the Soviet Union in the late 1920s and 1930s opened up the country's economy for women in the workplace. And there was indeed no job for which a woman could not apply. Mm -hmm. Soviet propaganda encouraged them to join the workforce and steer the great machines of modernization. And the most fantastic symbol of that particular age of machines was the airplane. Many were inspired by Soviet heroine Marina Raskova, who set world records for long distance flights, showing what pilots and planes from the Soviet Union could achieve. Newly emerging and quite popular flying clubs were also a chance for many women to escape the monotony, or the poverty, of their homes and learn how to become an aircraft mechanic or even a pilot themselves. Fast forward to the summer of 1941. Weeks after the German invasion, hundreds of thousands of Soviet women flocked to the colors, enlisting as nurses, signalers, or anti-aircraft gunners. The experienced female pilots of the flying club served as instructors and advisors for male recruits, but were not allowed themselves mm -hmm. to fly into combat. The argument was that there were enough male pilots available. Yeah, it's interesting. That's something they, they wrote also on their website that we read, which was um, that, even though they were very experienced, they weren't allowed to go into combat. Um, and they're only allowed to basically instruct the male pilots who can go. And I think the reasoning because, of course, was um, the fact that they, they, the Soviets figured they had enough men to send into combat on the airplane. Basically, um, she went to Stalin directly and asked for, um, for to basically to form three regiments of her own that were uh, purely female uh, groups. So they, there's only female pilots made up of only female pilots. And the night witches, of course, were one of those groups. Right. So. Pretty interesting, and I, I like they included like some of the actual photos that they included. That, that I found interesting that one poster they did, the one of the propaganda posters for basically trying to encourage women to go get into the workforce. And what it just reminded me of was I think the um, during World War Two, I think um, basically the Americans they want to encourage women to contribute towards the war, war, war effort as well. And they had this one famous post uh, poster saying we can do it with like a bicep flex. <laughs> Roxy the Riveter. It's, oh, that's what it was. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. So that, that's just remind, reminded me of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so cool little connection. Yeah. My Marina. Grandmother, hmm? My grandmother was a uh, Roxy the Riveter. Oh, really? Yeah, she built uh, battleships in uh, in Oakland. Nice. Yeah, that's very cool. Combat. The argument was that there were enough male pilots available. Marina Raskova, however, was determined to make a difference. With her influence in Moscow's political circles as a hero of the Soviet Union, she appealed to Stalin himself and got permission to create three all-female flying units, the 586 Fighter Regiment, the 587 Heavy Bomber Regiment, and the 588 Night Bomber Regiment. Raskova was a natural leader, and her call for volunteers was soon answered by hundreds of young women from all over the Soviet Union, hoping to break into the ranks of elite female pilots. By mid-October, as confusion and chaos swept Moscow in the face of the rapid German advance, Raskova had set up her training camp at the large aerodrome in the city of Engels on the Volga River. There, the women of the three regiments were to be trained with planes, engines, armaments, and aeronautical studies and military drills. 
Hmm. What's interesting here is these different photos. I just know it's like right here. Mm -hmm. Remember, I, um, I mentioned in our previous video that they had the rank, some of the uniforms, like the older ones, the early war uniforms, they had like the rankings on the shoulder, mm -hmm. I mean, on the, on the collar, on the collar and versus later they switched to collars on the shoulder boards because, of course, if a, if a German sniper could see from a distance what rank you are and you're an officer, they'll go for you as their primary target. So on the shoulder boards, it's kind of hard to see what rank you are. But in the previous image right here, see the difference? It looks like here they, they do have the shoulder board mm -hmm. rankings so that you can see it on the shoulders instead of the collar like it's showing in this image. Mm -hmm. So just a little subtle difference I noticed. Um, we, I'm guessing these photos, photographs were obviously taken in different time periods. Sure. So. Well, the college-educated women were trained as navigators. Those with factory or armory experience would work as mechanics. Naturally, all volunteers wanted to become famous fighter pilots themselves, but only the most talented and experienced pilots were accepted into the fighter regiment. They needed lightning quick reactions and the ability to remain calm in battle. The professional pilots with many hours of experience were put into the heavy bomber regiment, led by Raskova herself. Those with less experience were put into the night bomber regiment, but those women may have needed the greatest courage of them all. I always find it interesting when you see that footage with like the bombs dropping out. Um, let me pause it, like right here. See, I wonder how they how they said that. Do they specifically just have like a camera, uh, like looking down and showing the bombs falling out? I wonder what the purpose of that was. Um, so just kind of I wonder if, if also it was a, a visual scope for the pilot to see oh. what was below them and then when to release the bombs. Right, and I think it it requires definitely a lot of training because when you drop a bomb, it's gonna keep flying forward from a distance. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to like preemptively drop your bombs um, in order for them to land where you want, unless they're heavy enough to where they will land near where you drop them. I'm but, curious. But even still, you're absolutely right, depending mm -hmm. on how heavy they are uh, with the, grav the pull of gravity, it would, you'd have to assume right. and estimate, when, time it. Yeah. Based on the wind and how far you are, how fast you're flying mm -hmm. when to drop those bombs. Yeah, because the bombs aren't just gonna go like straight down. They're gonna be falling at it like a little bit forward. Animal. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of, I think it's like kind of like an exponential angle downward from the plane mm -hmm. where it initially dropped it. The night bombers were to fly the Polycarpov U 2, a flimsy biplane compared to then modern dive bomber. There we go. So this is what I was envisioning when I thought it was going to be a World War II bomber. I was, I was wondering why they were on those flimsy bi biplanes, um, as he put it. Um, cause this looks much more what I would expect for like World War right. II. Um, I, biplanes I always kind of thought were mainly used just in World War One. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see that they, in fact, in World War II, they were still used then, which makes sense. Cause of course all the old equipment from World War One wouldn't just be discarded. It'd be carried over. Right. Well, and I think also we learned that they were very quick, easy and cheaper to manufacture. Right. Yeah. U2, a flimsy biplane compared to then modern dive bombers. It had been designed and manufactured since the late 1920s and was used most often as a training plane. It had two cockpits, one for the student and one for the instructor. It was a small and slow aircraft made from lightweight plywood and percale, which was finely woven fabric made out of cotton. It, it was cheap to manufacture, unimpressive, and outdated, but nonetheless, a reliable workhorse for transporting the wounded, dropping supplies, or reconnaissance flights. The Soviets nicknamed it the crop duster, or the duck, while to the Germans, it was to be known as the sewing machine, or the plywood rust, since it was totally defenseless and too slow to outrun any of the German fighter planes. It could only operate in the safety of night. In fact, though, even, even small oh, look at this. Wow. Down fairly easily. It's got shredded. But the yeah. overall situation was so bleak that even those little planes became symbols of hope and resistance. Over time, the women began to appreciate the simplicity of the crop duster, especially since the women of the heavy bomber regiment had to fly the SU-2, which was nicknamed the bitch because of how difficult it was to master. But despite Soviet theoretical ideology of equality between the sexes, Russian machismo was pretty merciless, wearing boots, tunics, and greatcoats 
way too large for them since they were designed for men. The women were constantly mocked and teased by their male counterparts for their lack of femininity. But this only hardened their determination since to them, a soldier was a soldier. Raskova ordered the women to crop their hair and the battalion's commissar forbade anything she saw as, as girl talk and prohibited any sort of flirtatious behavior. What he what he just mentioned as well about like the teasing and then them having to like prove themselves in combat. It reminds me of this one, uh, I think Soviet or Russian war film that I think it was covering World War One, if I'm correct, which also ha was kind of focused on an all female regiment, and it, and it kind of shows that as well pretty well. I feel like I think that might be an interesting movie to have you react to. Mm -hmm. So was that regiment um, were they infantry? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Huh. So it was boots on the ground. So. Boots on the ground. Yeah, I remember I. You've mentioned that before, mm. the name of that movie. Really? Yep. Wait, what do you mean? Uh, just that it'd be a, a great movie for us to react to, Boots on the Ground. That's that's the movie name? I thought that's what you just said. No, 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 no. Because no. I've heard you use that term before. Uh, boots on the Ground, I just use that term to, to refer to infantry. Like, they're not they're not in tanks. They're not on... Oh, uh, gotcha. Not okay. in airplanes. So it's reference <laughs> no. to, but not the name of a movie. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, I've heard you mention that. No, I'll just, I, I just say boots on the ground. It's basically saying, that, oh, yeah, it's, it'll be infantry. It'll be boots on the ground. <laughs> okay. Well, right. with this movie, we'll find out what that's called, and we'll yep. have to react to it. Yeah. All right. Let's continue. By late May 1942, they were finally equipped with enough U-2 aircraft to prepare for combat. By summer, they left the aerodrome for the southwestern front to meet the German advance on Stalingrad and the Caucasus. As Axis forces were advancing on Rostov, Raskova's night bombers hit the German ammunition and fuel dumps, the vehicles, and the ground troops. Now, it was the navigator's job to find the target and close in on enemy lines. Then the pilot would turn off the engine huh. and silently glide Gliding. through the night. Interesting. To be quiet. First, yeah. they would throw down flares to illuminate the targets, and the loads would be dropped. Then they would turn on their engines and escape before the Germans could fight back. The U-2s were converted to bombers by simple, at first improvised, attachments. A bomb load of up to 300 kilos was slung under the wings. Okay, this was not enough to inflict a lot of damage, but that wasn't the main purpose of the night bombers. They were to constantly harass the enemy, to deprive them of sleep and wear them down to grant them no rest periods. And for that, the Germans hated them. After learning that the night bombers were usually piloted by women, they would give them their famous nickname, the Nachthexen, the Night Witches. Mm, so Every that's how they got the name. The women came back with red faces and bloodshot eyes. They rebuilt their lives around their nocturnal life, having dinner in the morning and going straight to bed. They were constantly tired and hungry, but they were sure proud of showing the Soviet Union that women could fly as well as any man. And with every successful mission, they earned more respect from the male pilots and officers. But that would not protect them from the constant danger they faced. They had no parachutes, since Soviet high command figured that in case of engine failure, the planes could simply glide back to Earth. This totally disregarded the fact that the percale cotton fabric and plywood frame burned like crazy. And if that ever happened, it was likely that both pilot and navigator burned to death. But yeah, yeah, that's pretty surprising that um, that decision was made and that there's no like protest against it, or if there was, that it wasn't listened to. Um, no parachutes. Yeah, yeah, and and in and some of the reading that we did, we we skimmed through the reading of the website, but it looks like that basically what they did was they kind of took like the script for the history video and they carried it over to, um, to, the basically the website. Right. So, because so, a lot of the, the fact the things that he's mentioned is what we read through as well. Uh, so it's interesting to kind of uh, pretty much verbatim. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but we did, like I said, we did skim through it. So there's some stuff he's adding here, some details that um, were something that we skimmed through. So it's, it's, I'm like glad he's filling in all the details. But to Soviet high command, that was still preferable to being captured alive by the Germans. In fact, those who were shot down or crashed behind enemy lines were expected to fight to the death, as capture was dishonorable to any right. Soviet no soldier. And didn't you say something that there was a, a Soviet uh, saying about... Uh, no retreating or um, there. Uh, there basically there's two directives from Stalin himself, like executive directors or what whatnot. He gave these like orders to everyone, and or with one of them was no surrendering, mm -hmm. and the other one was not one step back, which refers to no retreating. No retreating. Yeah. 
danger and would leave a stigma for the rest of their lives. Yep, Even and it would, would affect your families as well. Down, behind the lines, but hid, and made it safely back to their own lines, were interrogated and often condemned to death by the commissars. On January 4th, 1943, Roskova died in an accident on her way to the Stalingrad front. But the 588 was determined to live by her ideals. And as one pilot wrote, it was a time for bombing and bombing. The memory of her. Right. Yeah. The Soviet counterattack prompted the hasty withdrawal of the Germans from the Caucasus and gave the night witches more than enough opportunities to harass and attack the retreating troops. From the steppes near Stalingrad to the high mountains of the Caucasus, the praise for the night witches grew. The freezing winter nights through which they flew at high altitudes with open cockpits did not discourage the women from fulfilling their missions. In fact, only once were they forced to remain grounded for a time. On the night of July 31st, 1943, during the German counteroffensive on the Taman Peninsula in Novorossiysk, the night witches approached the German positions and noticed that the anti-aircraft batteries were strangely silent. Suddenly, flares lit up the sky. It was a German night fighter attack. And in moments, U-2 planes were falling out of the skies, burning to the ground. The survivors broke off, scattering back into the darkness. Such high casualties in one night were a shock to the regiment, but one that didn't last long. The war that eventually turned against the German invaders brought the witches further to the west, to the Kuban, to the Krim. Wow. I'm just curious right there. I saw that there's an interesting shot there of a tank. I was curious if I could recognize the model. There it is. Uh, I'm curious to see. I can't really tell. Um, usually the most common one is the T-34, but if, it's, if this is a heavy tank, it could also be the KV-1, which was also a pretty common model. That was, and that was huge, right? Yeah. Uh, Krimian Veroshirov or something along those lines, I think, was, was like what KV stood for. So. Or, but that was but it, a, a very big one. It was a huge tank, wasn't it? Uh, it was a heavy tank. So it, had, it, was, it wasn't as fast as the T-34. It was very well armored. Um, when KV-1s were first introduced, they were a very, I think, a very new model at the start of the war. Um, the Germans, when they first launched the Blitzkrieg, against the Soviet Union to quickly like rush into it. Um, something they were caught off guard by was the tanks that the Soviet Union had produced because after the the, the Russo-Finnish war, after the, basically the Soviets uh, basically had that whole conflict with Finland and it, mm -hmm. it didn't go very well for them, um, they, what they did is they started to step up their tank production and the KV-1s, the heavy tanks, were one of the newer models. And there was one famous encounter between some KV-1 tanks and some German tanks where essentially there was 43 German tanks traveling in a column through the woods. And there, in the skies in the woods, uh, there was five KV-1 tanks. Uh, and they were led by this one guy. And I forgot his name, but basically he was, I think he was a pretty uh, well-known um, leader. And he basically ordered his tanks to wait until the German column had approached. And he... Then order, gave the order, and they took out the tank in the very front and the tank in the very back, which boxed in the entire column. And then all of the tanks were kind of just left sitting there exposed, and the yep. German tanks started firing back. And not one of the KV-1 tanks was lost. The, the five KV-1 tanks proceeded to take out every single one of the German tanks. And I think one of the tanks, which was the was which was the leader's tank, um, it had like 100 and, around 143 marks on it so it got hit like around 100 something times uh just on its turn and that one shot went through every one but, of the shots bounced off yeah <laughs> so but it was still operational and, yeah, yeah and they uh survived yeah so survived and that was that was a sh great example of how like the brand new heavy tanks i'm not sure if this is the one um, because i can't really tell from this this could be a t34 mm -hmm. but um it was just interesting to note that kv1 tanks uh the very end started the war there it kind of panicked the germans and that's then the germans of course they started stepping up their tank production it, with the tiger tanks the panther tanks that were really deadly could you repeat the name of the uh kv1 K kv1 tank what was that uh Klimian veroshilov i think okay. which was what kv uh stood for which was just like the factory producer like yeah. um uh, and then dash one that was like the tank so there's like the kv2 KV, yeah, KV-13, KV-43, I think there was another one. So there's lots of different tank models that they produce. It's just like KV-1 and KV-2s were some of the most well-known. Bam, to the Krim, to Belarus, to Poland, and eventually Germany itself. Sometimes they made up to a dozen sorties a night with only a few minutes of breaks in between. There are many stories of those young women who came from many different backgrounds and who did share their own personal tales of heroism, tragedy, and idealism. 
We were young and fearless. The fear came later, one of the survivors would recall. Heroic achievements and accomplishments led to more heroes of the Soviet Union. And you can see, once again, you can see and this This is a great photo because it's so clear, like well-defined, and also the color. You can see they have their rankings on their shoulders, the shoulder boards. So this was the newer uniform models. And of course, the color, instead of becoming like that V color, it just became a standard like wraparound color around your neck. Mm -hmm. So than any other Soviet bomber regiment, 23 by the end of the war, with usually at least 800 sorties made. After the war, and after the regiment was disbanded, their commissar, Yevdokia Rachkevich, took it upon herself to personally search for the crash sites of every last one of her lost flyers to provide an accurate history of the regiment and the women that served and fought with it. Interesting. They have one of their tanks on the stage there. Okay, badass women in bomber planes. That yes, was a really good <laughs> description, right? So how, did, sure. how did you guys decide to do to choose this? Uh, actually, you know, when we started doing research for heroes, uh, this was one of the first that came up for, yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah, we've that's been in our uh, what do you call it? Secret Sabaton archive for a while. All right. And uh, yeah, we just thought it was a perfect way to open the album as well. Yeah. We have a tradition of doing something surprising for the first song. And uh, I think that massive opening was a perfect way to start off the album, you know? Yeah. And then. Yeah, it was a very um, rapid paced song. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just noticed something interesting with the environment. What I like is that it seems like every time for these history videos, um, anything I do like sets up like a different background for them to sit on, right? Um, and I noticed there's something in this background that uh, is a, a cool little uh, shout out to the history behind this, which was, you see the rubber ducky? <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. It yeah, stood out to me. And I, I think that's pretty interesting because you would think like, why is there a duck there? Because it has nothing to do with like military stuff. With, well, everything else is like- Could history. be an Easter egg or something, right? Well, here's the thing. Yeah. One of the nicknames that was given yeah. to the biplanes was yeah, the, duck. the duck. And so I, I find yeah. it funny they included a rubber duck. Good the connection there. Yeah, because yeah. it was, of course, the nickname of the plane was the, was the duck. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they have some German helmets here as well. You can tell right here because they have that you famous flag in the back. Yeah, yeah, and you can you can tell these are German helmets because they have the kind of that ridge on the sides. Um, I forgot what what it's referred to as, but I think the World War One uh, helmets were even more obvious because they had like these little uh, things in them, uh, which basically gave it like the I think a nickname of like Frankenstein <laughs> helmets, kind of. So. I think many of them had the uh, I don't know what you call it, the horn. Oh, you're talking about like you're talking about the pike helmets. Yeah. The, in the interesting thing about the pike helmets is some of them I think some of them were steel, but a lot of them were actually made out of leather. Hmm. So. A little fun fact there. Yeah. You would think it'd be made out of like some sort of metal, but no, they were made out of leather. So it's purely decorative. Because if it was metal, you could use it actually to uh, impale someone if you needed to. No, I'm not talking about the spike itself. I'm talking about oh, the, the helmet covering. itself. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So, okay. Interesting little fact. I think that massive opening was a perfect way to start off the album, you know? Yeah, and then and then the tempo change into the into the. Oh, chorus. yeah, yeah. Sorry, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we did something different there also with uh, the chorus being half beat compared to the rest of the song, uh, hmm. which is something I really hate. But, but it, <laughs> why did you allow it to happen in this instance? It's the only time I actually thought it worked. Yeah. You know? uh, we wanted that. Whose suggestion was it? Who, who said, hey, come on, let's, let's do this? And you said, oh, I did that to myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. Uh. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I remember so clearly when we were doing the the PR for this album. It's a couple of years ago now, but uh, I was doing an interview and I was in the final stages of doing something else. I was in the studio. Interviewer were, was a bit nervous, okay. I should say, and not used to doing interviews. And we had like, I think a regular 30 minute interview. I was on the phone. He asked me to tell something. Well, you have a lot of stories. Could you tell me something from the album? You know, okay. story-wise. And I started, yeah, well, I can make an example yeah. out of the first, uh, out of the first song, and I started telling the story of the Night Witches. Okay. And I got a little bit carried away, you know, yeah, because yeah. I was proud of the song and the story, so I, you know, got carried away. And I probably spoke for about eight minutes about only that song and the story about it. When I was finished, it got silent, and then I hear, okay, and the next song? Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh God. You're good, you're good. Oh, that's yeah. brilliant. Oh. 
Now, what what was the reception for Night Witches? You know, I mean, was this because this is not something that's familiar to people? No, 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 no. I, uh, the story in itself is fantastic. No matter if it would have been men or women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the right. fact that it is women, it's a you know extra nice bonus, I think. Yeah. And uh, it's very it's, Soviet Union too. Yes, you know? and. Uh, it's still, you know, a part of our live set, very popular with the fans and us as well. Yeah. I think we have some of the coolest, you know, pyro and video stuff going on on that song Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. So uh, I actually really enjoy playing that because I get off, we all, all, I guess, go off stage as the live intro for that song starts. There's a good shot of the tank there. Um, yeah, and see the symbol here. You saw this in the uh, yeah. in the video. What's interesting is um, with uh, 588. I'm assuming there's a turn here, but I noticed that it kind of looks like um, some of the Soviet World War II. Um, they're not referred to as tank. Samochodne uh, ustanovka, which is like self-propelled guns, which weren't really considered tanks. They were considered like these kind of like these tank destroyers. And so a lot of them wouldn't have a rotating turn. They'd just be kind of a stationary gun that can go up and down. Hmm. So you have to actually have to turn the entire vehicle in order for it to line up its target. So it kind of remind, this look kind of reminds me of it, but I'm assuming this is maybe a little bit more modern and different. So, and I sing the first, well, the intro off stage, and I just keep get running in on the first boom of the verse. But I, I have a very important... He's getting quite the cardio workout there. Yeah, he <laughs> to, is. He's having to run across the stage really fast, back, back and, and forth, forth, back and forth. Important question that I'm pretty certain everybody, who not only everybody who watches Sabaton history, but everybody who's ever seen Sabaton or listened to Sabaton wants to know. Um, now, Night Witches, right, they, they you know, to avoid, um, you know, any outward appearances of too much femininity and stuff because of problems with the male soldiers, they all cut their hair really short. They all crop their hair, right? One... Do you think any of them had your hairstyle? <laughs> <laughs> and two, do we have any pictures of you when you were a kid with like the same? Did you have the same like? I was you... born like this. All right, Joachim. Well, thank you very much for this today. Thank you very much. You know, I always love talking to you about these songs. All right. Well, we'll... yeah, it's interesting that he points that out. He does have a. I, I just realized, yeah, he does have a very unique um, hairstyle. I don't see that a lot, or anywhere, I think. <laughs> uh, maybe more in the '80s. <laughs> oh, so have you seen it before? Yeah. Oh, you've seen that exact same style mm -hmm. with like with like the line down the middle and then the sides. Yeah, interesting. We'll see you next time. Thank you all on Sabaton History. <laughs> really good, indeed. Yep. And we actually do have a part two to this, so we're gonna be watching that one as well. Yeah. Uh, I I always see him in right, his performances. Everyone. He has you know that best. Real. You click, 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 click. Get some um, subscriptions. Check out in these other channels. Become a Patreon. That's it. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> okay, well, there we go. <laughs> Get out of here. Good night and goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think it's interesting. Uh, every single one of these history videos, whenever they show a clip of like one of his uh, live concerts, he always has that uh, vest on. That mm -hmm. was like the unique um, with the metal plates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I found that that interesting. Um, what do you think? Oh, I love their uh, their songs. The music, mm -hmm. music is is really enjoyable, great to listen to. But what I like is the history behind it. Yeah. And now Indy goes into it. Uh, he goes into depth. Yeah. You know, some yeah. of the things that are are just fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, like he was saying, even with um, the no, no, not Indy. The lead singer said. The lead singer. He said, um, you know, it was a great story about what they were doing, but even more so because they were women. Because that was unique, right? You right. Know, back then, yeah, yeah, yeah pretty interesting. Um, and I'm looking forward to part two because, uh, which we're about to go into, mm -hmm. because, um, like I said, for this first part, a lot of the stuff we read on the website, but for the second, for the rest of the page, we, we kind of we did, like we didn't really go into it because yeah. we thought it was going to a separate subject because the song was very much focused on the pilots. And what it sounds like is for the second part, um, it's going to be talking less about the pilots and more about just in general some female heroes throughout mm -hmm. history. So I guess we'll learn something new there. Yeah, so, yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah. So with that being said, let's get ready to play. Let's let's jump into the next one. All right. All right, guys. So we brought up the next video. We got part two here. Um, interesting here is it looks like this is uh, over virtual. Um, and we checked checked in the description and it said uh, something about quarantine. So I'm guessing this was released around the time of COVID, um, which is interesting to note. Um, in fact, if I take a look here, let me double check once again. Uh, this 
quarantine sabaton history is back and this was released in 2020 so yeah this was during during of course the quarantine sure so um with that being said robert you already jump into this uh webex meeting or ver zoom meeting <laughs> <laughs> let's do it night which is part two female soldiers yep yep yeah. so let's do it i'm Patrick sabaton I'm Spartacus from Sabaton History. And I'm Indy Nidell. And as you noticed, I am not the main host of this episode. Uh, yeah, interesting, because I think this is the first time we're seeing Spartacus, right? Mm -hmm. um, interesting name. The reason why, as some of you will know... And first time Indy not being... Not his, being the host, yeah. yeah. And not in his normal studio. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, he usually has a very... ...in Time Ghost yeah. channels is that I have the coronavirus. Um, oh, wow. I'm a lot better now. I was sick for three weeks or so. I didn't have to be hospitalized and I didn't have the big breathing problems, but it was pretty, pretty nasty anyhow. But I still can't have anyone into my place and I can't leave my place, which means I can't properly do any lighting or filming. So Per and Spartacus are going to do this episode together. Take so that's just why he doesn't have the studio, of course, because he was sick with COVID. Um, he was quarantined. Yeah. Quarantine, yeah, it says he said three weeks. Um, I actually was sick with COVID as well. I think the main symptoms for me didn't last longer than a week, like for like the really brunt. I still had some after effects, but it wasn't too bad. Probably because I'm pretty young. So. Yeah, and it, yeah, exactly. A young buck over here. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, when it first came out, and this was 2020, uh, it seemed like it, it came with a greater punch. It mm -hmm. was it was much more. I, I think um, I think I got sick around t towards the beginning too, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But being younger, I think that right. probably helped out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So with that being said, Take let's away, jump guys. back in. I like how they always in use the that first intro. episode about yeah. night witches, uh, we talk about the female bombers. There are a lot of other women that fought valiantly in different wars, and we're looking at a few of those in this episode. She's got a cool Sabaton background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also really liked them. Um, I, I like the the band members' background as well. Let me see. Maybe his house. Uh, um, yeah, it looks really crisp and clean. Um, it almost looks like a studio in a way. <laughs> it's so clean. Um, it's interesting. There's like a team mounted there. I wonder if this is like a real life background or is it like a virtual background? I think it is real life. But just, I would imagine, yeah. Because when yeah. you look at the lighting, it's bright. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's very bright, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really like this look. It, it looks it, very Spartan, very European. It, it, look, it reminds me of like an office workplace. So, all right, let's jump back in. Mm -hmm. well, that's a cool shot. In Night Witches Part 1, Indy told you the story of the Soviet 588th all-female night bomber regiment who were known as the Night Witches by the German soldiers of World War II on whom they inflicted such misery. But they weren't the only ones who deserve remembrance for their deeds during the war. Today, let's look at some other badass women of that conflict who put themselves in danger either on or behind the front lines in the service of their country. When Lyudmila Pavlichenko was a teenager in Kiev, she joined one of the many para... And I, I think I, I do know her story. Um, I, I think I've seen this one movie. I think it was Battle for Sevastopol, if I'm correct, that I think is about um, based about her story. Hmm. And that's one that I actually really want to have you react to, that, that one film. It's really well done. So she has an interesting story. Battle of Sevastopol. Battle for Sevastopol. Hmm. Uh, Sevastopol, I think is how you pronounce it in Russian. Mm -hmm. so. When Lyudmila Pavlichenko was a teenager in Kiev, she joined one of the many paramilitary clubs of the Soviet Union. These were not only to keep reservists in shape, but were also open to the public. Pavlichenko was a born athlete and a natural with a rifle. She trained hard to outshine the boys and she earned her marksman certificate and sharpshooter badge with ease. During the late 1930s, she enrolled into Kiev University to study history, like all badasses do, and also aced at sniping school of the Soviet Red Army. The week of the German invasion in June 1941, Pavlichenko was among the first female volunteers to stand in front of the recruiting office in Odessa. At first, they urged her to become a nurse, but Pavlichenko insisted that she wanted to fight with the infantry. A quick examination of her badges and certificates was enough to convince the recruiters and she was sent off to serve in the 25th Shapayev Rifle Div Division. And she became a very famous sniper. She was to become one of 2,000 female snipers in the Red Army during the war. Only 500 of them would survive. Wow. The story goes that 
While her division was awaiting the advances of Axis forces on Odessa that summer, they sent out snipers to harass the enemy. At first, Pavlichenko was paralyzed by fear as the Axis advanced on her position. But suddenly, the young man next to her was killed by an enemy bullet. That snapped her right out of the fear. She took his scope, Mosin Nagant bolt action rifle, scored her first two kills of the war. The first of many. In just two months of fighting for Odessa, she is said to have killed 187 wow. mm -hmm. Axis soldiers. Wow, as a fell in yes. October, her unit was taken back to Sevastopol on the Crimea, awaiting yet another siege. By May 1942, she had really made a name for herself and was promoted to lieutenant after marking her 257th kill. She was sent out on even more dangerous missions like counter-sniping, which was a duel to the death with enemy snipers. Pavlichenko killed 36 of them. Wow. <laughs> yeah, in the, in the movie, I'm going to have you watch Battle for Sevastopol. There's actually a, a scene there where... It, she for days would stay up um she would, like she would just be laying in the same position for day day and night day and night for several days trying to basically um find out where the enemy sniper is and they both have like a standoff and then eventually she kills him first hmm. um so pretty pretty famous um, that's a famous event a real event and portrayed in the movie yeah yeah okay. um she she is very famous for getting hundreds of kills as you can see already 257 uh, 87 no no she, it, that was just i think the first estimate right um because he just mentioned it took her kills up to 257 ah oh, okay i missed that um here i can i can double check that yeah, one part real see. quick the first of many in just two months of fighting for odessa she is said to have killed 100 that was just the first two months of in the first two months yeah awaiting yet another siege. By May 1942, she had really made a name for herself and was promoted to lieutenant after marking her 250. So you see, and then go. she made a name for herself in the continued months to where she brought it up to 257 kills already. And I think it's probably gonna go even higher than that. Cause like I said, she's famous for getting hundreds of kills. I don't know if it was 400 something. I don't remember the exact figure. I'm sure he will let us know. Mm -hmm. So. seventh kill. She was sent out on even more dangerous missions like counter sniping, which was a duel to the death with enemy snipers. Pavlichenko killed 36 of them. After being hit in the face by mortar shrapnel in June, Soviet high command took her out of the line, though. She was a well-known hero and was now too valuable to lose in combat. She was Lady Death, the female sniper with an official total kill of 309. Oh, wow. 309. So I wasn't sure if it was 400 or 300. So yeah, a little over 300. Big, and, that's a significant number. Yeah, and it's interesting, as he mentioned, that now she had become a public figure. Um, she became a source of inspiration for many women, and so of course they didn't want her to be lost in battle sure. after after that close call that she just had with Shrapnel. So they pulled her out, and I guess they used, started to use her more for PR. And I remember in the movie they also they also showed that she actually traveled to the U.S. to try and urge. Uh, she, I think she like met with the president or whatnot, and she even like w was part of like an assembly to like urge for the U.S. Um, contribution to a war effort or something along those lines. I forgot the exact the exact reason she was there, but it was something along the lines of get, basically gaining further help from their allies. Mm. So. Once she left the hospital, Pavlichenko became a propaganda tool. She was sent overseas to Canada and the U.S. on a publicity yep, tour. She was the first common Soviet citizen the received of, uh, the White House. Roosevelt. Yeah, and she Eleanor went to Roosevelt. Exactly, and she she went to the White House, um, and I think that's of course she met the president. So mm -hmm. pretty interesting. Yeah. Pavlichenko spoke freely to the crowds about her experiences at the front, how the man she loved was killed soon after their marriage, and of the terror the Germans had inflicted on her home. But while the public found this really interesting, the press seemed typically more interested in the length of her skirts, and the look of her masculine uniform, and questions like if the girl sniper wore makeup at the front. Pavlichenko remarked that the Americans should worry less about the looks of her uniform and more about what it represented. There were plenty of Americans who understood that, of course. Although Virginia Hall had lost her leg during a hunting accident in her youth, that had not deterred her from pursuing a career in travel. Hall spoke several languages fluently and had a keen interest in European politics, but when she applied to become a diplomat overseas, the U.S. Department of State was reluctant to hire a handicapped woman. 
All, however, was determined. In 1940, while most of the American public refrained from having anything to do with the war, Paul was serving as a volunteer ambulance driver in France. Retreating from the German invasion, she heaved wounded French soldiers into her truck, driving them to safety under constant threat of attack after attack from the air. After France fell, she escaped to Spain, where she made the acquaintance of a British intelligence officer. The officer was intrigued by Hall's dedication to fighting the Nazis and put her in contact with the newly formed Special Operations Executive in London. The SOE was trying to infiltrate occupied Europe, but so far the 50-50 chance for agents to survive the first weeks after insertion did not bring in many enthusiastic volunteers. And although the agency was reluctant to deploy a handicapped woman, they decided to put Hall into Section F, France. By April 1941, she had been inserted into Vichy, France and occupied a safe house in the city of Lyon. Her cover was that of a reporter from the New York Post who was there to gather stories about life under the new regime. The first thing she had to learn was to move around without being suspicious. She had different outfits and hairstyles prepared and made use of heavy makeup and disguises when she needed to turn into a different person for a while. It was doubt that kept her alive and a strong sense for danger was her best ally. Hal knew when to lay low when the French police was raiding houses or watching meeting points of suspected SOE agents. Nonetheless, she soon built up her own network of informers and worked closely with the French resistance. Over the winter of 1941-42, she used a brothel to hide exposed agents or British pilots that had been shot down over France before smuggling them out to Spain. Her most famous feat was an actual prison break where Hall's network freed several agents from a French prison. By mid-1942, her activities attracted more and more attention from the German secret police. And after the prison break stunt, they began cracking down hard on the resistance right. movements for which Lyon had become a hotspot. Yeah, I think in history, the uh, French resistance movements were pretty famous, um, especially during like World War II under Nazi occupation. They're not just um, hurting but just in general. Just, I think there's lots of French resistance um, to the Nazi occupation that, mm -hmm. that happened. And of course, um, when the U.S. came in with, through D-Day and they helped liberate France. So uh, they, had a, they had fought their way free. Yep. Paul even attracted the attention of the Gestapo leader Klaus Barbie, known as the Butcher of Lyon, who supposedly said that he couldn't wait to get his hands on that limping bitch. Wow. After the Allied invasion of North Africa in November 1942, France became too dangerous for Hall, and she fled the country. She then joined the OSS American Intelligence. Although the OSS was at first, like everyone, reluctant to employ a handicapped woman, by 1944, Hall was back operating in France. Disguised as an old woman, she supported several resistance groups and prepared safe houses for agents in the south of France until the Germans retreated. Virginia Hall had survived far longer than many other agents, and she laid the groundwork for many espionage techniques that are still in use today. But she had to fight hard to do it, not only against the enemy, but against all the doubt from within the ranks of her own. Before the war, Simon yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, that was an interesting story. So that was my first time hearing of her, um, and I don't think I've heard of uh, Simeon. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, I have um, he'll pronounce it for us, but I'm not sure if I've heard of this um, lady here either. So. And so the yeah, and the previous one was an American uh, spy. Spy, yep. But uh, did he mention where she was from? Uh, was New York or or? I think so. She that was a, that was her cover. She was a New York Post uh, reporter, basically like New York Post reporter, um, and lost her leg in a hunting accident. When yeah, yeah, young. when she was young. Yeah. Uh, that was her cover when she came to France. When if anyone was to ask her, she would say she's she's basically um, reporting back on what life under the new regime is like. Of course, with uh, Nazi occupied France. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mon Sigouin had lived a normal teenage life southwest of Paris. Her father had been politically active in her hometown and was very vocal against the German occupation, and she greatly admired his patriotism. Now, he had fought in the Great War as a volunteer, and this war she wanted to do her part. The German conscripted her to work as a seamstress in Paris, a big mistake in hindsight, because in her workplace, she made contact with members of the underground resistance. They fixed her a fake passport under the name of Nicole Minet from Dunkirk. 
Her first mission was to prove herself to the resistance and steal a bicycle from a German officer. She then used that bike to transport secret messages between resistance members in the town of Chartres. As a young woman, she was less conspicuous and had an easier time moving around among the German soldiers than a man would. There's a tank right there. Um, I'm wondering if this is a Panther tank. Um, I'm not too familiar with the German models, but I think this might be a, a Panther tank. Have you heard of that? Uh, pretty, pretty famous model. Um, yeah, it wasn't the tanker, uh, the Tiger tank before the Panther tank. I'm, sure, I'm not sure which one came out first. The Tiger tank is, I think, is more is more of a heavy tank. Well, it, it is a heavy tank um, with like heavy armor. I think Panther tank was a little less heavily armored, but it was still super deadly um, in the way that it operated. Sure. Um, and of course, the big uh, big example of like the heaviest tank not always be the best um, is like the T-34, which is a medium tank that the Soviet Union had used. Um, it it was more lightweight, but it was still very effective. And it was, of course, easier to produce. Heavy tanks, the problem with heavy tanks is they're very costly. They take a lot of material, and if they they're break slower. down, yeah, but they're slower. And if you if they break down, it takes more time to fix them. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, what's interesting is like I find it funny how she how he mentioned that story about like <laughs> her stealing the bike from the German guy, um, and then that bike was used later on. I think there's one story I haven't fact checked fact checked this story, so I'm not sure if it's f true or not. Uh, I'm assuming it is, but there's this one funny. Um, <laughs> funny like little um piece of history where apparently when hitler was visiting france some french uh, resistance fighters or um basically basically ones who weren't happy with the uh, nazi occupation um, i think when he was going to the eiffel tower or some famous french building it was, it was obviously a long way up and what the resistance did is they like disabled the elevator or whatever so he was forced to take all the stairs all the way hmm. up <laughs> i've never heard that yeah Interesting factoid there. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll try if I'll do like some quick research as I'm editing the video and I'll maybe I'll pop up a fact on the screen. Yeah, if, if it is the case. So yeah, we'll see. Conspicuous and had an easier time moving around among the German soldiers than a man would. Always on the lookout for high profile targets, Seguin was soon involved in several sabotage and demolition missions in the area. The young, courageous and reliable woman made such an impression on the resistance fighters that they trained her in the use of firearms. As the war neared its end, Seguin's unit took to street fighting the retreating German soldiers during the liberation of Chartres. Seguin, submachine gun in hand, assisted in arresting 25 German soldiers. Then, the famous war photographer Robert Kappa came upon her unit, and he took the famous picture of Simone Seguin oh, wow. with her German yeah. submachine gun. Wow, that is a great photo. So this is what's for, um, like I said, this is my first time of hearing of her. But look at that photo. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very, it, it's very crisp and clear, which I would not expect mm -hmm. for so long ago. Uh, wow. <laughs> and again, uh, given the, the time, um, to see um, uh, a woman carrying a gun like that and ready mm -hmm. for war, no. uh, not common, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting how they how they're all kind of lined up. And you pretty can, cool. Pretty really cool. cool, and you can tell. Look at their faces. You can tell they're all nervous. They all look very nervous. There's the intensity too. Like yeah, this this so guy's like kind of even like hunched a little bit, and yeah. you can see his eyes are like wide. She also looks a bit worried, and so is this guy in the back. Mm -hmm. um, what what is interesting is um, if you look at the gun models, these guys they look like I'm not sure what model this is, but it looks like it's a single shot or like a semi. Mm -hmm. gun right but she's carrying a submachine machine gun yeah and right. do you do you know this model right here you i have it? no idea uh so i, I know because i played like lots of games like call of duty world war ii um this looks like an mp40 to me which is actually a german submachine gun which means she stole it from germans yeah. so pretty interesting mm -hmm. seguin soon became a symbol for the young generation that fought against the german occupation for resistance valued courage and activism no matter the gender the idea that women can be warriors equal to men is maybe best visually depicted in the photo of Kozarchanka. In the winter of 1943-44, the renowned war photographer George Skrigin traveled through the region of Kozara in the western Bosnia. There, he encountered a group of guerrilla fighters. See, by this time, large parts of Yugoslavia had come under the effective control of partisans who were fairly successfully fighting. Interesting. Why don't you go ahead and mention partisans? Oh, yeah. So, uh, Partizanskie Vojska is partisan forces um, in, in Russian, which was, of course, one of the main languages spoken in the Soviet Union. They played a huge role, and they're basically um, civilian fighters. They're people who aren't part of the official military, but they took up their arms to fight for their cause. Mm -hmm. um, and in many cases, that, ca that cause was very closely tied to the liberation of their country from mm -hmm. occupation. So, of course, partisans played a huge role, and they were particularly well-known um in uh in the soviet union so yeah 
And here, Yugoslavia. With yeah. the and I mean, ship. of course, the French resistance fighters are an example of partisan sure. forces. And that's not to say that the partisan forces are fully separate from the military, because in some cases, the militaries uh, of countries would co would basically collaborate with the partisan forces and secretly supply them with more gear, which uh, in cases where the country is occupied, that's, of course, against the rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. Fighting the Axis yeah. occupation. They're also known as guerrilla war fighters. Skrigin approached the partisan leader and asked if he could take pictures of the group. Among the female medics was the 17-year-old Milja Toroman, a Bosnian Serb who grew up in a small village near Mount Kozara. Wearing a cardigan, Milja swung a rifle over her shoulder, adjusted her Titovka cap, and smiled as she turned her head. At that moment, Skrigin took the photo. In 1968, long after the victory of the partisans, Skrigin published this photograph in a book of his war photography. There, Milja became Kozarchanka, the girl from Kozara. Skrigin simply described her as a young girl who had fled German captivity and joined the partisans to fight the fascists. The photograph was a huge hit, and Kozarshanka became a Yugoslavian icon. She embodied the partisan struggle and was a perfect fit for the propaganda of the communist Yugoslav state. It was a symbol that despite the danger of war, the partisans remained enthusiastic about their coming victory. Kozarshanka smiled, expressed confidence and optimism. Yeah, that's something that partisans had that not a lot of people did, like not a lot of official war fighters did, which, um, especially if you're invading another country, is your morale can be stifled because you feel like you're doing something wrong versus partisan fighters, like I said, most of the time are fighting for their country, for mm -hmm. liberation, for freedom. So in that case, they have, of course, a lot of morale, a lot more than a lot of soldiers did. Sure. So. It's definitely a fight from within. From, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, you have to think about it. You have to be really devoted to what you believe in in order to be able to uh, not being forced, not being drafted into this this fighting force, you're just freely volunteering yourself mm -hmm. and let, and putting your life on the line possibly for right. it. So. Innocence contrasted by the rifle across their shoulder. The true identity behind Kozarshanka was not ever revealed until the collapse of Yugoslavia. Interesting. So I, that's what I was wondering. I was like, is, is there, did we find out what her story was? Because I was curious, is it just going to be a photograph? Because I, I was very interested, like, did she survive the war? What was her story? And it sounds like he's about to go into it. Yet, in the though 90s. it was a stage photograph, Milia still remains a symbol, not only of the struggle of the Yugoslav partisans and the many women that fought in it, but the many women who fought for their beliefs, their nations, and their freedom during that great conflict as well, or even better, than any man ever could. Interesting. So it was a stage photograph. Yeah, I didn't pick that up uh, until he just said that. I yeah. thought it was not. I thought, I thought yeah. maybe he caught the photograph at the perfect time. So, but Pear, despite that you're a metal band and you sing about something very, very male, war, you have a lot of female fans, right? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of people who, who think that Sabaton only have male fans because it would suit the topic. Obviously, these days it's very easy to get some statistics and, uh, of who is coming to the shows, who is listening to our music and stuff like that. And uh, because of, um, of a, a project that I was working on, I was collecting a lot of statistics, especially from the last tour and from a lot of other things. And... Um, it varies about 30 to 40, 45 percent is the females. Hmm. Wow, that that's pretty well balanced. Yes. Yeah. The Sabaton crew sticks out with a little bit more of uh, women present. So um, I don't know if it's uh, that we are so attractive that the girls come. <laughs> and they just don't be shy about it. Come on. We, we sing heavy metal songs. But I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have the, the, the diversity of this. And you have an all-female fan club as well, right? Yes, we do, and it, and it ties to this uh, to this episode because uh, obviously they are the Sabaton witches, so it's the all-female <laughs> regiment <laughs> of uh, Sabaton <laughs> fans. <laughs> and we also have, a, you know, a new the newest member of our team, uh, Maria. You know, she runs. A, a doom metal club in in Stockholm when she's not working for us, and and that's yet another female metalhead. Oh yeah, I mean absolutely. And in the next, uh, we're going to uh, introduce Maria properly in the next episode because you guys who uh, are part of the uh, different tiers on the Sabaton History Patreon uh, group, 
uh, you will have a lot to do with Marie in the future because she's taking over all of that. She already did. She's already taken over that. I Indian Pair, uh, talking about patrons and, and our exclusive content that we make for patrons, there's something exciting coming up on Sunday, right? Yeah, that's true. We're going to have a, a streaming session, uh, including uh, me, Joachim, and you, Indy. And uh, we, we're going to talk about uh, different things, talk to the, to the patrons, uh, and answer a couple of questions, and have a little bit of interactive uh, online hangout meeting uh, with patrons. Yeah, like half an hour or so, something like that, for a little while. Yeah, we've already started collecting questions from the patrons, so so it's going to work like yeah, it's yeah, going to be fun. Any idea? Too bad and, we're three and, years and late. Like this. <laughs> the patrons get to ask questions and are actually there live for the live stream, but we are going to put the live stream up after it's done so that you can view it on YouTube as well. If you are unfortunate enough to not be part of the exclusive and wonderful group that is the Sabaton History Patron Group. Great. Uh, hopefully, I won't be so uh, interrupted by uh, a Russian team of uh, climbers that is the first people I see in a while that is actually climbing down on my balcony right now using ropes, making this look like some kind of uh, insertion of special forces. <laughs> I'm not sure what they actually plan to do, but if I am... Uh, uh, if I'm abducted soon, this uh, will be a very legendary broadcast, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we did confirm that this is his place, in fact. Um, but yeah, very, I can th very like minimalistic and clean look to it. Mm -hmm. um, so interesting. Pear, yeah. abducted by Spetsnaz in the middle of the corona crisis. <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, a story for sure. So, but you're in Moscow right now, Per, right? Yeah, I, I've been in Moscow since the, the ending of our tour. Uh, in March, we had a tour in Russia and we had a bo uh, to cancel it after uh, the corona put an um, end to all the shows. And uh, since then, I've been here. Uh, and so I'm actually working on some interesting projects for the future. Something that I think a lot of people have been looking forward and will be quite surprised when we launch. So... Uh, I'm not sitting here and uh, and uh, feeling horrible and uh, locked in for another reason. So uh, we have something really cool coming up in some years from now on. But it's a big project, so it started already now. Well, that is it for today, ladies and gentlemen. But I and Pear and maybe even Sparty will see you soon. Here on the Sabaton History Channel. Thank you so much for watching. I like the flames they have in the background when it's bursting. Listen to me, everybody. We love the Sabaton History Channel. If you do it, please share it with us. Support it on Patreon, YouTube, and any way you want. Thank you for your support. Let's do this forever. <laughs> Let's do this for a long, long time anyway. Uh, <laughs> I just didn't tell us to get out of here this time. <laughs> yeah, right, like the lead singer last time. Yeah. <laughs> So, that, that, how do you enjoy that? Yeah, really cool uh, uh, history, uh, historical overview of mm -hmm. four women who yeah. were heroines of World War II. Yeah, I, li I like how it kind of bounced back and forth between the different stories. Um, uh, the only one I heard before um, before this was, like I said, the very first one, um, which, because of course I watched that one movie on it. Um, so Yeah, the first one La Lady was Death. Uh, the, the Russian and then the American mm -hmm. and then the French and the Yugoslav. Yep. Uh, surprised they didn't bring in someone from uh, the UK. But um, really cool to highlight yeah. these four. Yeah, so um, it was interesting learning the history behind it. For the second one, we definitely uh, knew a lot less um, going into it because we, we, like I said, we only skimmed the pilot section because I was related to the song directly. And it's interesting to also get some of these other stories, war stories. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, we hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell icon for more video updates. And make sure you stay tuned. We will be back very, back very soon. All right, guys, take care. Die if you die, you just...